let's have a little bit of a panel discussion now with the principals who've already presented and I will encourage uh, Bonnie Fusarelli is here who's been involved with the, it's the Northeast yes, sir. Leadership Academy which is referenced before and I think she's a professor at NC State yes, and uh, Shirley Prince uh, is here to present later uh, who is Kirkland. I think she may wear several hats but in any event she's with the North Carolina Alliance for School Leadership Development uh, and what I'm going to do is ask members of the committee at this point if they have questions that they would like to direct to Dr. Tozer, to uh, Ms. Wagner, Ms. Uh, Hodgkin, Ms. Prince, and Ms. Fusarella. You all haven't spoken to us, but if you all want to chime in on a topic, I'm happy to do it. Uh, so. Yeah. Okay. You all see the little mics he's talking about? Okay. Now, Doc Tozer, can you hear us? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, cool. All right, so, uh, members of the committee, are there questions that you have for any of these folks? Uh, we need to. Well, I'll get the ball rolling in case others want. I've got several. Uh, Mr. Hodgkins and Ms. Wagner. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to hear Mr. Wagner, uh, Mr. Hopkins present once before, and I'm wondering if you might tell us a little bit more about what I will call the demographics and the culture at the school and how you address those things. Uh, maybe clarify for us, Ms. Wagner, when you first went to the school, but my recollection is that you talked about some of the things that you did to engage the parent and the community in supporting changes that you are introducing within the school and turning the, uh, I think um, Dr. Luminga earlier referred to a culture of high expectations. Can you talk just briefly about what kind of demographics were you dealing with and a little bit about what you did in that regard? Um, well, initially, I've, I've been there since 2008. Um, it actually was um, Roanoke Middle School at the time. Two years later, uh, we had a consolidation in our county. And so um, there was great turmoil, um, as usually happens with consolidation. But we were able to involve parents from all of the schools that uh, were involved in that consolidation. And um, I think that was kind of where we started um, at that, in 2010, where we started to um, kind of turn to parents um, to the idea of the higher expectations, not just for um, some students, but for all of our students in our building. Um, yeah, and our demographics are you know, high minority, 90% free and reduced lunch, and, and we also, um, you know, Open door policy is something that we definitely have. We actually took it one step further that we went outside of our doors. Uh, we spent a lot of time in the community. Uh, the churches in our communities, the small rural community, are a really big source of cultural uh, power. And that, that's really where the real leaders are. So we've actually gone and visited a lot of the community churches. And, and those, um, those pastors have been really welcoming to us and given us a chance to address their congregation so we can then communicate what our school is about, what our goals and our expectations are for, are for students. We get a lot of buy-in uh, from the grassroots community people. That, that's really helped us a lot. And, and I also, uh, especially for Mr. Uh, Hodgkins maybe, but Ms. Wagner, on the chart on the back of your handout that has the basketball terms, uh, lest I think I know what it says and I really don't. Looking at the uh, first column for sixth grade, reading, down at the bottom, the total is uh, 22 students. Right, so that, that's the out of 59. There were 22 were proficient out of 59. Right. Correct. Now, and in and, and looking at the breakdowns, over on the left hand where the slam dunks greater than 90 percent what that means is that evos determined that five students out of 59 had a greater than 90 percent chance of being proficient at the end of the year absolutely yes 
So by the same reasoning, if you drop down to the three pointers, uh, you've got nine students out of 12 who had only a 15 to 40 percent chance of being proficient and you had 75 percent of them actually be proficient at the end of the year correct and the only ones that didn't make it were the ones who didn't make proficiency other than a, a scattered few above there seemed to be largely the ones that were 15 percent or lower Is that the way that chart yes. reads okay um, Representative Stam, I'll interrupt my question. You go ahead. For Dr. Tozer, and then Chip, uh, chime in. A lot of hospitals have a head of the hospital or administrator who's not a doctor. Does a really good, effective principal have to have a teaching degree to be an effective principal? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. I'll bring my mouth to go prior content. One of them is that the data is expressed from the school for care of the line um, is important data to continually remind us that a really good principal can produce these kinds of outcomes. Um, and that the challenge is how do you produce those kinds of principles? In other words, it's no longer news that we can have a principal produce the sorts of learning games that you just described. What would be news is if universities could produce those principles almost every time out. Uh, it's our belief that that's possible. It's our belief that a number of institutions around the country are beginning to do that. And I want to just take a moment to congratulate Bonnie Fusarelli uh, for her work in North Carolina because I've been following it for a long time. And uh, Bonnie is one of those people that anybody would identify as being at the front edge of trying to answer the questions. What would it really take to produce this kind of principle every time out? Again, we're not there yet, but we're closer than we were by, by far than we were 10 years ago. In terms of in asking that question, what would it take, the question that the representative just asked is an important one. Does such an individual need to himself have been or herself have been a classroom teacher? Um, Illinois came down firmly on the side that such a person does need to have been a classroom teacher and in fact needs to have four years of experience with at least two years of demonstrated impact on student growth. Now, um, is it the case that somebody could be a good principal if they've never been a classroom teacher? Absolutely yes, there are examples of that. The question is, do you want to build a set of professional standards and approval processes on those exceptions. Um, the, the reality is that you could also have a professional basketball coach who's never played any basketball. That's possible. But it would still be an exception rather than the rule. So it's, uh, in our view, uh, we're willing to forego that occasional exception um, on the grounds that the work of being an instructional leader really requires that somebody understand instruction. And working with teachers to help them improve their instruction, in most cases, requires a principal who really gets instruction. And you don't get instruction without having done it. And the reason for that is teaching is a performance act, like playing a piano. Just as you can't learn to play a piano by reading books about it, you have to do it so can you not really learn what it means to teach well without doing it and just reading it from books. Could there be a strong instructional leader who's never been a classroom teacher? Yes. Do you want to build your education policy around that? For us in Illinois, the answer is no. Did somebody else on the panel? He mentioned no, this is Representative Johnson. Uh, uh, you, address, you mentioned uh, a Dr. Fuzzer, uh in your comments. Um, I would like to hear her comments as you stated that she would be the best one to address this. 
Oh, um, Steve and I know each other from several circles, and actually his program and my program are two of only four programs who have won a national award by UCEA, University Council for Educational Administration, as being exemplar models in the nation. And so that's something North Carolina can be very proud of, is that we do have one program here in the state that um, is nationally recognized. Um, the, the question I would actually, so I've actually have several hats, as, just as Steve does, as being a university researcher and also uh, directing a program, and then I also direct the alternative program um, at, at Northeast Leadership Academy. In my researcher hat, I've done research on alternative licensure, um, especially for superintendents. And the research is a little bit dated now because I haven't been in that area for a while, but looking at superintendents who have been from usually military backgrounds and other alternative type backgrounds. Uh, we've famous examples of the preacher in, in, um, in Philadelphia, et cetera. Um, the, most of the research indicates, or my research has indicated, that if the person who is a non-traditionally prepared person surrounds themselves with individuals who are very strong in instructional leadership and have very strong pedagogical skill sets and understand teaching and learning, then they're usually successful. If, however, they see themselves as the maverick and as the, the person that's going to go in there and change the world and that they don't need those skills, people with skill sets surrounding them, they usually fail and fail very badly, um, very quickly. So, Could I clarify my question? <coughs> Mark James and Stan. Yes. Maybe you could. I really wasn't asking somebody who had never taught, but somebody who didn't have a teaching degree. Let's, for example, Jim Martin taught chemistry, had a PhD in chemistry at Princeton, and taught chemistry at Davidson for years. But he was ineligible to be a teacher in North Carolina high schools. Could somebody like that who's taught but doesn't have a teaching degree be a effective principal? Well, I think you're hitting on two different problems, right? So one is how do we get folks with great content area knowledge um, into the classroom and so that we can be tapping that. And then the second issue is, are those the right type of people to be leading the school? Um, and I think that it, it's really contextual. Some places and some teachers will really not embrace a leader that hasn't had their feet on the ground. So teaching at the university level is a very different endeavor than having a whole bunch of 12 and 13 year olds who are resistant to learning and trying to keep them herded and, ground, and rounded up and, and teaching them how to be good people at the same time as teaching them subject area. And so I think that sometimes trying to get that street level credibility from your faculty so that they will follow you is a difficult thing to accomplish if you haven't been through that trial by ordeal, if you will, um, from being a teacher in the classroom. Do I think that there could be fantastic leaders? I, I would echo what Steve said, absolutely. I'm sure there's some great examples of people that could be wonderful leaders without having that experience of, of being a K-12 teacher. It's just an exception, not a rule. If I could speak to that really quick, actually, I'm sort of an example. My yeah. degree is in chemical engineering. Um, I came to teaching as a second career just because I was really passionate about it and wanted to work with, with young people. But as Dr. Post really just said, that I went through an alternative licensure program and, and got some training in education and then got some experience as a successful classroom teacher. And, and that's really what I rely on when I'm trying to grow and improve my teachers. And I do have a non-traditional uh, Representative Goodman, and then I'll be back to Representative Horn. I have a question about assistant principals. Uh, I know that's generally the pathway that uh, people take to become a principal. I was wondering if how you evaluate an assistant principal on, on the fact that they may or may not be an effective principal, and what are the traits in an assistant principal that you look to to see if they would become a Principal. I know a lot of people top out at the assistant principal level and just what do you look at? Is that the best way to evaluate a future principal? If we stay with the uh, coaching metaphors, I know a lot of assistant coaches are great assistant coaches and they don't become great head coaches. So would you just speak to that and let us know how you how you look at those things? Well, I would, I would just say initially that um, the first thing is that we use the North Carolina standards for um, assistant principals and principals. And my, I evaluate my assistant principals the same way that I'm evaluated by my superintendent. Um, I do look for uh, when I'm, I, I have had, uh, my first four years, I had three different assistant principals. Um, two of them left the profession. 
Um, I hope I didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> I don't think so. But, um, but I think that um, you have to yourself be have very high standards for your assistant principal as well as what you have for your teachers. And I think um, again, Dr. Mabungo spoke very highly about that, and and also. Um, um, Dr. Tozer spoke about having those conversations with people if that is not really the um, right field for them, and I think that can be. Um, I think in my um, work with the three interns that I've had through the NILA program, I think my being able to share with them my knowledge, my skills, but also as a principal being open to the skills and knowledge that they bring um, to the school and being open to that and unfortunately I think there are some principals that are not open to what a um, assistant principal or an intern can bring to them. Larry and I worked together for three years. His, um, his year as an intern, he was actually my <coughs> assistant principal. I did not have an, an assistant principal during that year and he learned very quickly and um, I was very open to the things that he was able to bring to um, my not just myself but also to my teachers my building and my school community and um, I, I hope I've answered that could, yeah. could, could I may I speak to that yes we, were, we saw your hand up and we were going to come to you <laughs> so uh, just a few things I want, is, it, is now the time for me to say something yes, yes. Two things to pull together here. One of them has to do with the question of how important is classroom instructional experience. And there's a good rule of thumb on that. The closer to the student, the more important classroom instructional experience. So for example, you want your teachers to be experienced classroom teachers. You cannot build an excellent system or an excellent school on the backs of first year teachers. It's not going to happen. Um, Secondly, for assistant principals and principals who are the next closest to classroom instruction, you want those folks to really know classroom instruction well because they are developing the teacher's capacity to improve their own instruction. Thirdly, by the time you get to the superintendent level that Bonnie was talking about, it's not so important. A superintendent really needs to make sure that he or she has building level leaders who deeply understand instruction. I think you can demonstrate that a, bill, that a superintendent can be weak on classroom instruction and still get strong district level results. Take it one step further. Does a governor who's a real education reform governor, and I'm remembering Governor Hunt from North Carolina, does a governor need to understand or have experience as a classroom? And the answer is of course not. And yet such a governor can have a profound impact. On, on student learning in schools by putting the right policies in place. So what I would want to remind us of is that the principal and the assistant principal are very close to the instructional action and the more experience they have as instructors, the better off that's going to be for teachers and kids. The other side of that is this. On the assistant principal side, some districts, and the, the best example of that is Gwinnett County, uh, Georgia, very large school district have used the assistant principal position as a very intentional and strategic pipeline to the principalship. The comment that was made that not all assistant principals are principal material is right on target. That's really true. Um, often, principals hire assistant principals not because they are going to be good instructional leaders, but because they fill other roles within the school. So at the district and state policy level, something for us to look closely at is really are the policies in place that are building the bench for the principalship in the future, or are we just letting it be haphazard and having principals uh, uh, essentially hire the AP that's going to help them the most? So we really need to think strategically about that because these assistant principals can be in a powerful developmental position if they're allowed to do the things that good school leaders do. And only then is it really fair to apply, as we heard earlier, the standards of principalship to evaluating them. If the assistant principal's job is buses and lunch duty and discipline, it's very difficult to apply a strong set of instructional leadership standards to evaluating that person. But if we make it an intentional and strategic commitment to make sure that APs are in fact uh, sharing the leadership load, the instructional leadership load in meaningful ways, then you've got a very different picture. 
Uh, I think Representative Dust Bomber. Okay. Representative Horn has a question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's a question and observation. One is uh, an observation and a <coughs> corollary to what you ju just said. And I'm sorry, I just came into the room, so I don't I don't even know your name other than Dr. Tozer. Dr. Tozer. Well, Doctor, I'm from Illinois myself originally, um, so we have some kinship. But as a corollary to what you said with regard to closer to the students and more classroom experience, there's a corollary to that to the extent that um, and teaching at different grade levels is different a different closeness to the student. That is to say, in, in Representative Stam's example of Governor Martin teaching at the university level, I would think that his ability to, and, and his effectiveness at maybe the junior and senior year of high school would, would be, he would be very effective, but teaching at 8th, 7th, and 8th grade, probably not, because there's a, a closeness difference between teaching at this level and teaching at that level, and then teaching at yet another level. So I, I'm struck as well by a comment from the Dr. Prince during a time when I met with principals with you, the comment was made that the principal and system should be the uber teacher. And I don't agree with that. But there are principals that do agree with that. And I, and I go back to the basketball analogy that you also used that uh, I don't think, uh, I think a coach, a good coach, certainly has to have had to have played basketball, but not necessarily be a Bob Cousy or a Kareem Abdul Jabbar. He could be a really good man on the bench and seldom even get in the game, but was always at the practice, etc. So it gets down to some more subjective criteria for who would be a principal, an effective principal, an assistant principal. And as you said as well about whether they're, what's their role as an assistant principal and what their role might be in a high school in, in uh, Union County might be different than a role of an assistant principal in a middle school in Craven County. And that would position the assistant principal differently as to whether they should be moved into the principal into a principal step. So, I guess my question is: is, is to what extent can we make the subjective objective, so that the the person yeah. involved here can be fairly treated and have the opportunity? But you know, there are a lot of people that. I was a sales guy, and, a, and good street salesmen are not necessarily good boardroom salesmen, by any matter of means. <laughs> and so if somebody performs really well, and you promote them, and they perform lousy, and you fire them, instead of moving them back to where they performed really well. That's, isn't that the peer principle? Mm -hmm. So that, that tell me about that subject of versus us. I think it would be great if other panelists did too, but I'll say it this way. Um, in business and in industry, and in sports and in education, um, choosing talent is still partly an art and partly a science. Um, North Carolina is a great basketball state, and you guys know that some of the people that we think are blue chip high school athletes don't turn out to be blue chip college athletes, and some folks who are great in college don't turn out to be great in the pros, even though we have all kinds of data that tell us how good somebody's going to be. So yes, part of this is subjective. However, the field is really making great strides in school leadership preparation um, at, at documenting what are those qualities in an, in an individual that seem to be the best predictors of success as a school leader. We've gotten much, much better at that. If we look at the top third of our principal's performance over the last 10 years, for example, in terms of their impact on student learning outcomes and graduation rates and other metrics in schools, we find that that top third, 80% of them were identified as top ranked candidates when we accepted them into the program. Now that means that um, 
there's another 20 percent of that top third we didn't really see were going to be top performers when we admitted to the program we admitted them but they weren't they weren't ranked at the top so the point here is that we do have some pretty good sense and some pretty good measures of uh, of leadership capacity but it's always going to be partly subjective as you say the fact that it's partly subjective should not lead us to think it's all subjective there are some things that we can pinpoint that tell us that, that person is highly unlikely to be a successful leader. I, I'd appreciate if anybody else from the panel might want to kick in on that one. Uh, Dr. Prince. Yeah, I think wait, that... Wait, 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 we got okay. sure. technology. All right. Okay. Yes. I, I think that in our state, there are people that are working hard to develop selection criteria to be able to identify principals who have a greater success, uh, or a greater chance of being successful. Um, I can tell you that uh, the principals that I have worked with, most of them, the really great ones, were great teachers. Because teaching and being a principal is really about being a great leader. A teacher leads their students to give 100% of their effort every day. And a great principal does the same thing with the staff. And so I believe that uh, there are some attributes that we are beginning to really understand and apply to selection. We just need to be much more deliberate about it. Okay. Uh, Dr. Fusarelli. And Representative Ford, I'll build on what you were saying. Um, we noticed that some of our best teachers coming into our program in NELA were not necessarily great at being instructional coaches to other teachers because they were very skilled at what they were doing in the classroom and how they were performing, but they didn't have a big toolkit to teach other people who might approach the problem differently um, to, to coach them through things. And so we actually revamped our curriculum around that to, at the beginning of the program, to give our, our new people coming in a whole bunch of toolkit, a whole bunch of skill sets and toolkits around pedagogical practices that really can impact and help kids move forward so that they are, you know, have a whole bunch of different things they can pull from. We also, and, and we were just having this, Jan and I were just having this conversation, have retooled how we select for dispositions um, for our program. And we're looking a lot more for people who really are that heart-driven, passionate, go get them. I really want to make a difference in the world because this is my mission. I'm resilient. I bounce back. I have a hopeful vision for the future. And these are the kind of people, and, and most importantly, let me back that up, joyful people. Because these are people who are around children every day. And I know that when my kid goes into that school, I want the principal to smile at them. I want my kid to be happy to be in that building. I want them, the school building and the place to be a place of joyous learning so that we can pe teach people to be lifelong learners. And so we're re our selection criteria have changed, and Jan has actually even said she's seen it just in her interactions with our newest cohort and, and some of our other cohorts. And so we're really looking for more those kinds of uh, things that aren't necessarily completely measurable, but we're going to track them over time and see that they make a difference or not. Uh, Representative Johnson. You're sitting down. I have trouble with your name at present. That's right. I know about what you've done. You can call me Bobby. And I know the results. And because they're data driven. Uh, what a, uh, we're talking about this decision and, and you're talking about the attributes that you are looking for. That isn't data. So how do you how do you accomplish that? How would your principal know who whom to pick as an uh, AP? Well, actually, we, um, we have created a, a rubric around this, and we use it during our assessment day. And we have two different columns. One is how do you rate them on, on this particular measure of being a heart-driven person? Has it come through in their interactions with others? When the janitor, we actually purposely staged this, when the janitor came down the hall, did they interact with that person? Did they say hello? Did they, they acknowledge that there's another human being in the space? to see when, they, when a K-12 student walked through the building, even though they're intensively involved in some other actions, did they acknowledge that? So one column is, how do you rate them? The next column is, do you think they're teachable? Do you think they have a growth mindset in that area? Because if they're teachable, then we can move them. If they're not teachable, then, then you know, let's not waste our time. 
And so I believe it is measurable. I think we can see it through interactions. I think we can create rubrics. And actually, one of my graduates, uh, uh, not from NILA, but from the NC State program, who's now an associate superintendent in another district, um, a large district here not too far away, um, they're starting to implement this in some of their how they're assessing their APs if they're ready for being principals. And they're creating a, a, a process where they're doing a lot of the same, looking for those dispositional skill sets because they're seeing that, that that human piece is the bigger predictor of are you going to be able to relate with the community, with the parents, with the teachers, and get the kids to be happy about being in school and engage in learning. We need that for legislators. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just, Teachability I just, fact. I, I just have one um, thought about talking about um, principals and how they're working with their assistant principal. Um, I take my job very seriously, and part of my job is to train future leaders. My job is to find teacher leaders and um, guide them, and, and you know, if they are so inclined to become principals, but it is also my job to train whatever assistant principal, in a small district like mine, I don't get to hire my assistant principal. I am assigned an assistant principal. And so, um, but it's my job to work with that person and train them just as it is my job to train teachers in how to better educate students. And it is my job to train students in how to be the best um, student that they can be. Other questions? Uh, Representative Jordan. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't disagree with much of anything that I've heard today. I think that that we need all of these qualities in good leaders for good schools, but I'm also concerned about some of our lowest performing schools that have been low performing for many, many years. I went to one when I was at Winston Forsyth County, and that school is still uh, in a low situation. I want to see how it can be fixed one day, but I'm wondering if we have, I would like the panel's opinion on this, have we lost any any aspects of discipline or respect for our leaders? For example, let me, let me, what I'm basing this on, you said think of a principal. When I was in the first and second grade in, in, in Winston Forsyth County, we had a principal, he was a, an older man, very well respected, very feared by the children. I feared him too. I remember one day, he was behind our school bus and we were a little bit exuberant. And he had that bus go back to the school and he got up on that bus gave us a talk to. Him. And I'll tell you what, we, we didn't behave like that again. But from what I'm hearing, we may need some of that in some of our lowest performing schools before we can even get to the point where they can develop teachers and APs and so forth. Where is that foundation? How much of that do we need? Have we lost any of it? What what are your thoughts on that? Is that you're not as so I think you understand where I'm getting at. What what are your comments on that idea? Yeah, the, the, I'll, again, I'll try to be brief in, in case somebody else wants to chime in on this, but um, you can't be much of a classroom teacher if you don't have good classroom management skills and have an orderly classroom. I'm just going to start in the classroom. Similarly, our research tells us that it's very difficult to improve student learning in a school unless it is a safe and orderly climate for students. So there's a, uh, I don't think our field has lost that. In other words, I, I think that um, I would also say that uh, this is not just true for our struggling schools, it's true for all schools, that a safe and orderly environment is absolutely critical. A principal who doesn't understand that can come into a high-performing school and actually do damage by not uh, supporting that kind of set of values. So uh, this is another reason that some really fine classroom teachers make fine leaders, not all do, but uh, they do understand the importance of a safe and orderly environment for kids that they're really going to learn. And certainly, our principals absolutely learn that in our program. And I'm going to bet that that's also true in, in Dr. Fusarelli's program also. I'll give you one example of, of a high school. Wait, wait a second. We got to. OK, go ahead. <laughs> I'll give you one example. And I think that there's, there's a, my, my students lovingly call, refer to me as, as Mama Wolf. Um, because I think that you have to have that, that harsh edge, but then you also have to have that, that loving, caring about somebody to move on forward. 
And one example of one of our graduates who took on one of the lowest performing high schools in the state. The first year that he was there, the year before he was there, there were over 1,100 incidences of violence at that school. Documented violence. Fights every day. His first year that dropped to over uh, under 400, and this year so far that number he dropped off of that under 300. And so, and when you look at that on a graph, it's like this. The test scores have gone like this, so you have the inverse. And so I think it's possible to do both, to come across as he clearly articulate your expectations for behavior. We train, um, and Larry can talk about this, we train to that you teach people how you expect them to behave, both the kids and the adults, and they'll rise to those expectations. And I think that's what your principal did. We aren't gonna let you go on, if the bus isn't going back. It's coming back, we're gonna teach you right now, right here. We're not letting that go. And the little things matter because the little things add to a larger climate. And so I think you can do both, but it's part about, and that's the other part of it, you have to, if you're committed to making a difference in the lives of kids, it takes courage. And that's the biggest thing that I think some of our leaders are lacking. And, I'll say, and I, I, I hate to talk disparagingly about some of the people who are in the job, but um, it, it requires courage and energy because it's really easy to let one or two low performing people, let it slide. It's harder to write it up. It's harder to document. It's harder to have that conversation with that student about how they can improve their behavior than just to suspend them. It's harder work to do it right. And so it takes courage, energy, and strength, and that's what we try to select for. Okay, just real quick. Uh, for me, it's, it's procedures and relationships. So one of the things that we change, actually, we used to have a case where kids would be off the bus, they'd all go to the gym, wait for a little bit, and that was just a, a cauldron, basically, for, for some issues. So now, actually, they get kids get to school, they go right to class. So that actually gives us more instructional time and just takes away some of those opportunities for those off-task things. And then relationships, one, getting to know the students individually, myself, and also the community members, too. And, and I really rely, honestly, uh, custodians, substitute teachers, and bus drivers. If I get to know all those people well, actually, I probably know someone who knows that student's uh, grandmother, their mother, their aunts, and their and their uncles. And so when I when they know that I'm going to check up on them um, with people in their family and that they know they care about them, that communicates to those kids that I care about them and I have high expectations, then I'm going to be able to have some impact actually in redirecting this behavior. Um, and I'd like to also add that when, when Larry was speaking earlier, I thought to myself, well, this man really gets it because he was talking about procedures and processes and so many principals don't focus on that enough and so what they become are reactive leaders rather than proactive leaders and a proactive leader along with his or her staff is going to come up they're going to anticipate the challenges and the problems that may occur and they're going to have processes and and kind of you know just the way we operate around here already in place so that it is an orderly, proactive environment for the kids. And that's really what leading from the front is. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I'm going to uh, ask, uh, Representative Johnson has a, a, what I'm going to ask be the final question. Uh, this is exactly the sort of discussion that I hope we would get to, but we also have some other important presenters that I want to try to get in, so I'm going to call on Representative Johnson and hope that uh, the committee members We'll share any other questions with staff. We can get you email addresses. Dr. Tozer has offered to accept those questions, but uh, Representative Johnson. I just want to um, make a closing remark. And that is that I'm sitting here and listening to each person and I'm listening to the questions that are coming out. And that makes me um, very proud that the legislature now we'll have the North Carolina, let's see what your exact name is, North Carolina Alliance for School Leadership. Makes me know that we as legislators made the right decisions in the House Bill 97 in order to train ours because we're answering the questions um, um, that we need to know, but we're also in House Bill 97 given the support that's needed uh, for them to do what you're looking for in your system get that principal in, to get that school turned around. So you've already made the first step to answer the 
question that you're asking. You know, we, we did that. Um, even though it was just in the budget bill, it, it passed the House. Okay, well, thank you all so much for coming and sharing your collective wisdom and experience with us. And I hope that we will use this information and this exchange uh, to build a better principal preparation program in North Carolina for what it can do for our students.